The dust is settling after Thursday's arrest of Donald Trump in a Washington, D.C. courtroom on charges of conspiring to overturn the 2020 presidential election. As we wait for more dust to get kicked up, a clear picture is emerging of what the Republican Party looks like moving into the 2024 presidential election, and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for the Republican Party as a political apparatus. Now, this can change rapidly, but only if they nominate somebody other than Donald Trump. Traditionally, the presidential nominee of a party becomes the de facto chief of that party. During the primary season and in the lead up to the primary season, unless it's an incumbent, the chairman of the party is merely a placeholder who keeps the machinery moving. In other words, it's the president uh, or the previous president who really runs the, uh, the party and uh, the chairman of the party is a placeholder. But once a candidate becomes the nominee, the party belongs to him. The party belongs to the president, which is why Rince Priebus became Donald Trump's very first chief of staff, even though as chairman of the Republican Party in 2016, he worked actively to undermine Trump's candidacy. But when Trump became the nominee, Priebus, as chairman of the RNC, he got in line. Uh, yeah, you know, the Access Hollywood video came out uh, right before the general. Remember, that was when Trump talked about grabbing a woman, a woman's, you know, you know. But even then, Priebus got in line. And when Trump won the election, Priebus the head of the RNC, became Trump's first chief of staff to signal that the entire Republican Party is going to put their quarrels with Donald Trump behind, and we are all behind the president. This is, ever since he won in 2016, this is Donald Trump's party. The Republican Party belongs to Donald Trump, and it's broke. Because anything Donald Trump touches either gets arrested or goes broke. Politico reported earlier this week that Michigan's Republican Party is completely broke. They can't get anyone to donate. Uh, Colorado's Republican Party is going to be evicted from its office. It can't pay its rent. Minnesota's Republican Party last month reportedly had fewer than $54 in the bank. Why is that? Because the party belongs to Donald Trump, and he doesn't want anyone donating anywhere other than to his super PAC because he needs to pay his mounting legal bills. So, unless a new nominee emerges this fall, this is Donald Trump's party. And because it's Donald Trump's party, there's no money. Because when there is a pool of money anywhere, Trump wants it for himself, not for his down ballot candidates for himself. So whatever money is sitting there, Trump is going to take it. There's an interesting story from back when he was a candidate in 2016 in May of that year, when it became apparent that Trump was going to seal or steal, seal the nomination, the party set up a transition team to make sure Trump would be prepared to assume office in the following January, just in case the impossible happened and he won. To staff this executive branch, uh, it's necessary to start months in advance. There are thousands of people uh, Republican loyalists who must be vetted. So after Trump is elected, he can hit the ground running. And Donald Trump appointed Chris Christie to run the transition team. Christie had a budget of a few million dollars paid for by the Republican Party to open up an office in D.C. and start staffing Trump's incoming administration if he won. This is back in May of 2016. You got to prepare, right? 
But when Donald Trump discovered that Chris Christie was taking money from the Republican Party to focus on the transition, Trump became irate. According to Bob Woodward, Donald Trump screamed at Chris Christie, that's my money, not yours. The transition money, that's my money, not yours. And then he accused Chris Christie of stealing from him. That's my money because Trump saw a pool of money sitting there in the Republican Party and he said, mine, mine. After Trump was elected, he immediately fired Chris Christie. Chris Christie, the day after Trump was elected, Chris Christie was no longer head of the transition team. Donald Trump put Mike Pence in charge of the transition, probably for the sole purpose of making Pence tell his wife, Karen, I'll be transitioning. Remember Mike Pence? They try to hang him on January 6th. Anyway, so the Republican Party is broken right now because Trump is siphoning all the money. He's telling People, donate to me. Donate to my super PACs, not to the Republican Party. He wants it all, especially now, because, well, once he officially became a Republican nominee for president again, the Republican Party stopped paying his legal fees. If he weren't running again, the Republican Party would be paying all his legal fees that he racked up while he was president. Before he announced, the Republican Party was on the hook for all of Donald Trump's legal fees for any lawsuits filed while he was president. And there are many. He was told, however, that if he officially becomes a candidate for the 2024 presidential nomination, the Republican nomination, then When it comes to all those legal fees, you're on your own. And so right now, his Save America Super PAC has turned into a clandestine legal fund for him and any White House associate who promises not to rat him out. According to the most recent filings, we've been talking about this, but the new filings have come out and they're astounding. It's staggering. New filings, mandatory filings, With the Federal Election Commission, according to these filings, Donald Trump's Save America PAC has spent $40 million on Trump's legal fees this year alone. That's a lot of money before the primaries have even started. Ron DeSantis is, I think he had going into the second quarter, like 20 some odd million. You can run a small campaign at this point. And so what is he doing with what is Trump doing with $40 million? It's a lot of money from small donors. It's going to the lawyers. It's going to the lawyers. And why why would it go to the lawyers when Donald Trump insists he's a billionaire? Why isn't he self-funding at least his own legal bills? Why is he tricking his small money donors into giving him money? They have no money, and they also have no idea that their hard-earned money is going to lawyers. Trump's supporters, they don't know this yet. They have no idea that they're essentially donating to lawyers. But in the Republican debate that's coming up at the end of this month, Chris Christie is going to be telling Everybody, when you donate to Donald Trump, you're essentially paying his lawyers. Chris Christie is going to say that on the debate stage. And from what I've been hearing, so will Ron DeSantis. They don't want to call him. Well, Chris Christie will call him a criminal. Ron DeSantis, the bully, is too chicken shit to call Donald Trump a criminal, right? But he and probably Nikki Haley will address the legal fees. And why are you donating money to Donald Trump when all that money is going to lawyers? This is in the run up to Iowa, a battle over money. You don't qualify for the debates unless you have 40,000 individual donors. DeSantis and Christie want to cut Trump's money supply 
So you can be certain during that debate, whether Trump is there or not, DeSantis and Chris Christie and maybe Nikki Haley are going to keep hammering Trump's super PAC for spending all that money on legal fees. You need 40,000 individual donors and Mike Pence may not make it. Mike Pence may not make it to the debates. He cannot find 40,000 individual donors. Maybe you should pray a little harder to your God, Mike Pence. Huh? Well, the fact that all this money is going to his legal fees raises the issue of whether or not Donald Trump is, in fact, a billionaire. He says he is. But why would a billionaire need charity for his legal fees? Because Trump is not a billionaire. Trump is not a billionaire. Billions of dollars may pass through the man. But if you re- if you read the reporting done by David K. Johnston, who has been following Trump's financial woes for decades, when it comes to Trump's business dealings, the money comes in one door and then out the other because Donald Trump is a money launderer. That's his business. He's a money launderer. The reason he is or was in real estate, the reason he is or was in casinos is because those are the two of the most efficient money laundering industries you can find. Casinos are a cash business. Do you really think the mafia got into the casino business because they thought the real money is in taking advantage of degenerate gamblers? You think that's where they think the money is? No. The real money for the mafia And for Donald Trump is in using casinos to take in dirty money and make it look clean. Manhattan real estate is one of the greatest money laundering machines ever invented. You look at any piece of commercial real estate here in Manhattan, it's owned by a collection of shell corporations. And each shell corporation is owned by more shell corporations They're like those Russian nesting dolls filled with Russian oligarchs. And all those separate shell companies can trace their headquarters to a post office box in Delaware or Reno, Nevada. The government lacks the resources to untangle who the real owners are of these Manhattan buildings. And that's why it's impossible to trace where the money to buy these buildings came from. Well, we know where they came from. They came from Uzbekistan, Russia, Ukraine. It came from any country where the oligarchs are transferring their country's assets into their own pockets. That's how it works. Dirty money goes in, clean money comes out. But it must pass through someone who appears legitimate. And that's where Donald Trump comes in. Money goes through him like the steak tartare at Mar-a-Lago. It's out his ass before it even reaches his tongue. So, yeah, Trump can say he earns billions, but he doesn't keep any of it. It's going to the banks he owes money to. And those banks he owes money to are all in on the money laundering. In other words, on paper, it'll say Trump owes money to Deutsche Bank. But Deutsche Bank knows and Donald Trump knows who that money really belongs to. And he better pay it back because that's the people whose money he laundered and they don't look to the courts for justice. So read David K. Johnston. Uh, He's been very thorough about this. Trump can't afford to pay his legal bills. He doesn't have the money. That's why his campaign, his super PAC, is paying his legal bills. His entire presidential campaign is about staying out of prison, so it's only fitting that the campaign also pay his legal fees associated with keeping him out of prison. $40 million so far this year alone, and that's just the money that came out of his super PAC. $40 40 million in legal fees so far this year alone that we know of. 
Maybe Donald Trump wasn't a job creator when he was president. He, the only president to lose so many jobs is Herbert Hoover during the Great Depression. He did not create jobs as president. He lost jobs. But he has created thousands of jobs for lawyers. And I'm guessing that he has brought them, and I'm being conservative here, several hundred million dollars in business. I think since 2015, when Trump first came down that escalator in Trump Tower, which he doesn't own, his name is on it, he doesn't own Trump Tower, when he came down that escalator to declare he's a candidate for president, between that time and now, how much do you think he's racked up in legal fees? How many millions? What did Russiagate alone generate in legal fees for him and all his associates who not only had to go before grand juries, but congressional committees as well? It would be interesting. Somebody should add up all the legal fees and then see who paid all those legal fees. When you go before the House Intelligence Committee, you need a lawyer to make sure you don't perjure yourself. Think of all the White House staffers dragged before congressional committees, grand juries, Robert Mueller. Think of all the Trump associates who were convicted and how much that costs to be convicted. Think of all the people who were convicted, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Michael Cohen, General Michael Flynn. General Michael Flynn, I'll be talking about him later. He pled guilty to lying to the FBI about his contacts with Russia. The former deputy chairman of Trump's campaign, Rick Gates. Uh, George Nader. Nobody talks about George Nader. Uh, he was an informal, informal Trump advisor, now doing 10 years for child pornography and bringing a boy to the United States for sex. Hmm. Maybe QAnon is right. Uh, then there was George Papadopoulos, who pled guilty to lying to the FBI about his contacts with the Russians. Granted, a lot of them were pardoned, but the list goes on and on. If you're not pardoned, you're still indicted. That's expensive. And if you're acquitted, it's like Tom, Bar Tom Barack, Trump's friend. I don't know if Trump is capable of having friends, but supposedly Tom Barack is Trump's closest friend. He was indicted and eventually acquitted last year of illegally lobbying Donald Trump in the White House. But how much did it cost Tom Barack to stay out of prison? How many millions of dollars did it cost in legal fees just to be Donald Trump's friend or associate? Legal fees now for White House officials, his friends, uh, Trump, Trump campaign officials who racked up millions in legal fees trying to stay out of prison. Uh, who's paying all that? Who's paying all that? I'm going to talk about who's paying all these legal fees. And you would think it would be scandalous. But this country is run by lawyers and they got a good thing going. So it's not a scandal. It is a scandal because the entire legal profession is a scandal but it's unseemly to look into who's paying everybody's legal fees. We're talking, I think, about hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees that Donald Trump has generated since 2015. We have a problem with the legal profession here in America. They're scumbags. Something about the law schools turns like 99% of American lawyers into scumbags. America has the worst prisons in the industrialized world. It's not about real, uh, rehabilitation. It's about being punitive. And why is that? Lawyers, lawyers. One of the reasons uh, Americans are terrified of going to prison uh, is because the prisons are dangerous. And if Americans are terrified of going to prison, they will pay a lawyer everything they own not to get convicted. It is in the best interests of criminal attorneys for prison to be a living hell. 
the worse prison is, the more you will pay to stay out of it. That is why our prisons are, I mean, you just, I don't mean to be indelicate here, but it's a given that if you're going to prison and you're a man, uh, you know what's going to happen to you. Uh, I don't want to get into details, but uh, I don't want to say it. Alec Baldwin, for example, had to sell a beautiful multi, multi million dollar estate in the Hamptons immediately after he was accused of shooting to death that cinematographer on the set of Rust. You know why? Because he couldn't go to prison. Alec Baldwin cannot go to a prison in New Mexico. And his lawyers said, Alec, I will keep you out of prison. But you know this sentence I'm uttering right now and the next sentence after that? It's going to cost you $5,000. Here, listen to this, Alec. <clears throat> that sound I just made? Another $5,000. They bill you for everything because they're scumbags. I have mentioned this, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up. I've talked about this since my divorce. During my divorce, one of the attorneys literally billed me, literally billed me for sending me a bill. She itemized her billable hours, and I looked at the, the bill, and she charged me an hour for preparing the bill. Now, that's just for a divorce. Imagine what they charge to help you stay out of a prison that's even worse than marriage. Millions and millions, because lawyers are scumbags. Their job is to transfer your money into their pocket. That's why they want prisons to be a living nightmare. That's why we don't do rehabilitation in prison. Lawyers want us terrified of going to prison. It's in their best financial interest. Special counsel Jack Smith, who I don't believe is a scumbag. I don't think he is. You never know because he's a lawyer. But he knows that the legal profession is run and policed by scumbags, which is why five out of the six co-conspirators named in Tuesday's indictment are lawyers. And if the sixth co-conspirator turns out to be Boris Epstein, then all six of the co-conspirators are lawyers. This is an indictment of lawyers. January 6th, the way it's being prosecuted, it is an indictment of the legal profession. And who pays their fees? Who pays their fees? I want, I, I, to me, that, follow the money, follow the legal fees. Uh, I'd like Congress to look into just how many hundreds of, and hundreds of millions of dollars Donald Trump generated for lawyers since 2015. Now, we know the Republican Party pays some of them, right? Until Donald Trump declares again, right? So for a while, the Republican Party was paying some of those legal fees, at least for Trump. And we also know that Trump's super PAC pays some of his legal fees, as well as the legal fees for Peter Navarro, Walt Nauta, Kosh Patel, Dan Scavino, and several other high-profile Trump White House officials either indicted or called before Jack Smith's grand jury or before a congressional hearing. Now, I've already talked about Stanley Woodward. That's Stanley Woodward on the right, walking Walt Nauta into the Miami courthouse after Nauta was indicted for his role in Trump's mishandling of classified documents. Stanley Woodward has been on retainer 
since at least last year, receiving money from Donald Trump's super PAC to offer legal assistance to any Trump associate who's either been indicted or dragged before a grand jury or a congressional committee. I mean, he is the go to lawyer in the Trump family, not the family, but, you know, Trump's associates, low level associates who can't afford a lawyer. What else I reported in the past month, and nobody else has, and I don't know why. And this, I believe, is one of the most underreported stories of the year. If I looked into it, Stanley Woodward also defended Oath Keeper Kelly Meggs. And that's his wife, Courtney Love. On the, I, don't, I think that's his wife, Kelly Meggs and his wife were indicted. But just look at the guy on the left. That's Oath Keeper Kelly Meg, who was convicted this year of seditious conspiracy for the role he played on the ground during January 6. OK, you talk about the violence committed on January 6. OK, think about the violence on January 6. OK, right now, Trump's apologists are insisting Trump didn't instigate the attack on the Capitol. It's a freedom of speech issue, they say, that he's free to stand before a heavily armed crowd, and he knew they were heavily armed on January 6th, and his freedom of speech, his constitutional rights allow him to tell these heavily armed imbeciles that they must march down to the Capitol and fight like hell. Well, that is not protected by the First Amendment. You know, you've heard of shouting fire in a crowded movie theater. On January 6th, Donald Trump screamed, take out your guns and fire in a crowded movie theater. Which brings me back to Stanley Woodward. Trump and his lawyers and his apologists are insulating Trump from what happened inside the Capitol on January 6th. They're trying to paint a picture where Trump had nothing to do with all that violence. They're trying to portray Donald Trump as someone who was just trying to, just trying to win an election. He's not connected to any of those violent rioters. Well, if that's the the picture you're painting, if you're trying to insulate Donald Trump from the marauders on January 6th, why is Stanley Woodward defending Kelly Meggs, the founder of the Florida chapter of the Oath Keepers, one of the top leaders of the Oath Keepers, instrumental? He, uh, uh, Kelly Meggs, uh, a jury found him instrumental in the violence on January 6th. So much so that he's serving 12 years inside a federal prison for seditious conspiracy. All right. He was sentenced, I believe, was last month. Stanley Woodward represented him. Who paid Stanley Woodward to represent an oath keeper? It doesn't take a genius to see that Stanley Woodward representing an oath keeper as well as Peter Navarro, who was part of the command center in the Willard Hotel the night before January 6th, along with Roger Stone. He was in there. Uh, who else? Steve Bannon was in there. Rudy Giuliani was in that command center and Michael Flynn. It doesn't take a genius to see that Stanley Woodward is the straight line that goes from the attack inside the Capitol straight to the Oval Office. OK, this is Stanley Woodward, lawyer to high level Trump administration officials and this guy, Kelly Meggs. OK, an oath keeper. Think about this for a second. Stanley Woodward this year 
was defending Trump's closest associates in the Oval Office, as well as Kelly Meggs, one of the leaders of the Oath Keepers, who either last month or the month before was sentenced to 10 years for seditious conspiracy, the key word being conspiracy, for the role he played on January 6th. Now, think about this. If you were trying to insulate Donald Trump from the violence that occurred inside the Capitol on January 6th, then why would the lawyer Donald Trump keeps on retainer for all his closest associates, Stanley Woodward, why would Stanley Woodward also be defending Oath Keeper Kelly Meggs, who only weeks ago just got sentenced to 10 years in a federal prison for seditious conspiracy, conspiracy for the role he played on January 6th, seditious conspiracy, conspiracy. It means he conspired with others. Who? Who did he conspire with? Why is Trump's lawyer serving as his attorney? At the very least, it doesn't look good. You would think that Stanley Woodward would say, you know what, I I probably shouldn't represent an oath keeper when I'm trying to insulate the president of the United States from all the violence that took place inside the Capitol in January 6th. Has anyone investigated reports that Sidney Powell, who was General Michael Flynn's attorney when Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to FBI agents and then had to be pardoned by Donald Trump, and then General Michael Flynn, who reportedly helped Donald Trump draw up an executive order in December of 2020 to seize the ballot boxes. It has been reported that General Michael Flynn helped Donald Trump draft an executive order to facilitate the military rounding up ballot boxes in the battleground states that Donald Trump lost. Uh, Michael Flynn, General Michael Flynn, who Barack Obama warned Donald Trump not to appoint his national security advisor because he's cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. That's what Obama said. The guy's not all there. Uh, But Trump didn't listen. And that was Donald Trump's first national security advisor who lasted, what, you know, a mooch time, right? I think mooch lasted fewer days than Michael Flynn. Uh, And so Sidney Powell was Michael Flynn's attorney, and Michael Flynn introduced Sidney Powell to Donald Trump, who Donald Trump reportedly called Sidney Powell, quote unquote, crazy. Donald Trump told Hope Hicks, Sidney Powell is crazy. Sidney Powell is so crazy that he planned to name her as special counsel inside the Justice Department in the waning days of his presidency so she could drum up phony election fraud cases and start arresting Democrats. This is Sidney Powell, one of the unnamed co-conspirators in Tuesday's indictment. Lawyer, has anyone investigated reports that came out last year? that she helped pay the legal fees for Stuart Rhodes. And I talked about this two weeks ago on the show. This is really important, especially since Tuesday's indictments were five, possibly six of Donald Trump's co-conspirators are lawyers. This is really important. Has anybody investigated reports that Sidney Powell helped pay the legal fees for Stuart Rhodes, the founder of the Oath Keepers, who is serving 18 years right now. He was sentenced earlier this year to 18 years for seditious conspiracy for the role he played on January 6th. Seditious conspiracy. He is serving time 
for the cache of weapons he brought to Washington, D.C., under the impression that he was about to be deputized by President Trump on January 6, once Trump began using his emergency powers given to him through the Insurrection Act of 1792. Now, supposedly, the Justice Department, before Jack Smith became special counsel, supposedly the Justice Department was looking into whether or not Sidney Powell was secretly paying Stuart Rhodes legal fees. Now, that was last year. What happened? I don't know. I'm just, you know, kind of interesting, kind of important, because we have a problem with lawyers in this country. Now, we know from Stuart Rhodes' lawyers, he was not uh, represented, I don't think, by uh, anybody from, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't represented by, for example, Stanley Woodward. I don't, th I don't think uh, his lawyers were connected to Trump. We, but Kelly Meggs, who was uh, Stuart Rhodes' second in command, essentially, he was represented by uh, Stanley. Okay. Uh, now, we know that Stuart Rhodes' lawyers, Rhodes, the founder of the Oath Keepers, uh, his lawyers said during the trial that Stuart Rhodes showed up on January 6, convinced Trump was planning to invoke emergency powers given to him through the Insurrection Act. Now, the first Insurrection Act was passed in 1792. I th was Thomas Jefferson president? I think it was Jefferson. Let me know in the comments section. And then the Insurrection Act, Insurrection Act got fully codified into law in 1872, 1871. It's really the statutes that were passed in the 1870s upon which we gain a clearer understanding of what a president can do when he invokes the Insurrection Act. Somehow, Stuart Rhodes, and this is the defense his lawyers used to try to keep him out of prison for seditious conspiracy, it failed. But his defense was that he thought Stuart Rhodes thought Trump was going to invoke the Insurrection Act on January 6th. And somehow, Stuart Rhodes came to believe that he and the Oath Keepers would be deputized into assisting Trump in restoring law and order. Now, where did he get this idea from? Where did Stuart Rhodes get this idea from? Maybe he just imagined it, possibly. There is reporting that on January 6th, Stuart Rhodes was on the phone on January 6th with someone. He was on the phone talking to somebody. He was overheard by another Oath Keeper, who became a witness for the prosecution, a witness for the January 6th committee, a witness, a former Oath Keeper says that he heard Stuart Rhodes on the phone with someone and the person he was talking to was either in the White House or someone who had access to the Oval Office. And he heard Stuart Rhodes urging Trump or one of Trump's close, more likely one of Trump's close associates to invoke the Insurrection Act. January 6th is coming down. You know, they've invaded the Capitol and Stuart Rhodes is screaming into a telephone, tell Trump to invoke the Insurrection Act. Again, that is the, the testimony of one of the Oath Keepers who became a witness for the prosecution, as well as the January 6th committee. How did Stuart Rhodes get the idea to drive cross country to Washington, D.C., bringing with him a cache of weapons for a small army to engage in a seditious conspiracy? We know he's doing time for seditious conspiracy. How did he get the idea in his head that President Trump 
would be deputizing him on January 6th. Did he just imagine that? Probably. Good chance. Or maybe somebody promised that he would be deputized. By whom? Maybe General Michael Flynn, who was working inside the Willard Hotel Command Center next door to the White House in the lead up to January 6th? Maybe. Perhaps it was Michael Flynn's attorney, Sidney Powell, who was named in Tuesday's indictment as a co-conspirator. The same Sidney Powell who might have been funneling money through her nonprofit to Stuart Rhodes in order to pay his legal fees. It was reported a year ago that prosecutors in the Justice Department were looking into whether or not Sidney Powell's nonprofit was funneling money to pay for Stuart Rhodes' legal fees. What happened to that investigation? Especially important since Sidney Powell, we know, it hasn't been confirmed, but we know she has been named as one of Trump's co-conspirators in Tuesday's indictment. We know from the January 6th committee that the Oath Keepers provided security for Roger Stone, one of Trump's oldest friends and political advisors in the days leading up to January 6th. We know this. We also know through text messages turned over to the January 6th committee that the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes and Kelly Meggs, were planning to provide security for General Michael Flynn in and around January 6th. Maybe they were providing security to Stuart, uh, to General Michael Flynn. So I want to know we've got Stuart Rhodes sitting in a federal prison for seditious conspiracy. Who put the idea in Stuart Rhodes' head that he would be called upon right after Donald Trump invoked emergency powers granted to him by the Insurrection Act. I want to know. I'd like to know. By the way, according to the Brennan Center, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Insurrection Act. It's kind of interesting and put it into perspective, if you don't mind. Uh, According to the Brennan Center, the president of the United States has used the Emergency powers granted to him by the Insurrection Act 30 times. In American history, I think going back 230 years, the Insurrection Act has been invoked 30 times. Okay, and I'm going to go backwards. The last time it was invoked, okay, was when George Herbert Walker Bush was president. George Herbert Walker Bush invoked the Insurrection Act during the L.A. riots in 1992. He also invoked the Insurrection Act in 1991 when locals in the Virgin Islands began rioting after Hurricane Hugo. Sound familiar? George W. Bush shit the bed after Hurricane Hugo and the locals in the Virgin Islands began to loot and he had to send in the National Guard. Remember his son after Katrina leaving uh, African-Americans in Louisiana to drown? Well, Donald Trump wanted to invoke the Insurrection Act, but there were no National Guards people to send in because they were all off in Iraq fighting an illegal war. So the uh, last president to invoke the Insurrection Act was... George Herbert Walker Bush, Uh, he invoked it when black people started rioting in Los Angeles. He said, well, that's an insurrection. And then black people started a riot in the Virgin Islands because he shit the bed on Hurricane Hugo. And George Herbert Walker Bush said, well, that's an insurrection. You know, black people getting upset is an insurrection. Before that, the Insurrection Act was used in 1987 by Ronald Reagan after 1,400 Cuban detainees 
began to riot inside a Georgia federal penitentiary when they were informed that they were being sent back to Cuba. Now, Cubans, as we all know, are people of color. At least some of them are. And so the last three times the Insurrection Act was invoked was to stop black people or people of color from rioting. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Let's see when it was invoked before that. Okay, Lyndon Johnson invoked the Insurrection Act in 1968 after Martin Luther King's assassination resulted in civil unrest in Chicago and Baltimore. You see how this works? After President uh, Dr. King was assassinated, black people got upset. So Lyndon Johnson invokes the Insurrection Act and sends American troops into Chicago and Baltimore. Black people, people of color, when they protest or riot, it's an insurrection. It's really amazing. Uh, Okay, so when was the Insurrection Act invoked before that? Well, in 1967, Lyndon Johnson sent in the troops to quell a riot in Detroit. He invoked the Insurrection Act. These are the only times the Insurrection Act has been invoked. Okay, so 1967, Lyndon Johnson sends in the troops to quell a riot in Detroit, because like in Los Angeles in 1992, black people in Detroit in 1967 had had it with the police. And one thing led to another, and the governor sent in the National Guard. 43 people ended up dead. 75% of the dead were black, and two-thirds of everybody killed were shot to death either by the police or the National Guard. Okay, it's interesting. Let's see if we can find a president who invokes the Insurrection Act when it doesn't involve black people or people of color. The time before Detroit. Detroit was 1967. Well, 1965, Lyndon Johnson invoked the Insurrection Act. He federalized the Alabama National Guard to protect Dr. King and civil rights protesters who were marching from Selma to Montgomery. Okay, that it still involves black people, but he invoked the Insurrection Act, if you remember, to protect black people from a police riot. Selma was a police riot. So that's good. When was that's first time I'm seeing the Insurrection Act invoked for for positive means. Uh, when was the Insurrection Act invoked before that? Gets better. It's, this is going to start making you feel good. Uh, not about the 21st century, but the 60s. In 1963, President John Kennedy invoked the Insurrection Act to federalize the Alabama National Guard and ordered them to stand down after Alabama Governor George Wallace called out the Alabama National Guard to prevent black students from attending traditionally all-white public schools. Here's the thing about George Wallace, bad guy, right? But he did stand down. Do you realize how scary that is? Kennedy uh, wants the schools integrated. We're talking about Alabama. And you you have the Alabama National Guard on orders from Governor George Wallace. Uh, He tells the Alabama National Guard, stop black people from going to white schools. And Kennedy invokes the Insurrection Act and nationalizes George Wallace's National Guard in Alabama. In other words, the federal government steps in and says, we're taking your National Guard. It belongs to me now. And that there was no guarantee that that was going to end well. This was 1963. Can you imagine a Democrat today behaving like Kennedy or Johnson? Can you imagine a Democrat who would federalize the National Guard in a southern state to protect black people today? I don't know. Okay, when was the Insurrection Act used before that? 
three months earlier in Alabama, when again, Governor George Wallace stood in front of a schoolhouse door and tried to prevent two black students from enrolling in the University of Alabama. Kennedy federalized Wallace's National Guard, right? And to George Wallace's credit, he stood away from the door and he let those kids register. Before that, the Insurrection Act was invoked in 1962 by President Kennedy in Oxford, Mississippi, to quell a riot of white people objecting to African-American James Meredith enrolling in the University of Mississippi. In 1966, uh, James Meredith was shot by a sniper in Mississippi. He survived. He's still alive. He's 90 years old. And you uh, don't hear from him too much because he's problematic. That's why you don't hear from him. In 1989, he became an advisor to North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms, a renowned segregationist. Although he was good on uh, aid to Africa uh, when, uh, when it comes to AIDS. Uh, but James Meredith was an advisor to Senator Jesse Helms, a segregationist. Wait, it gets worse. In 1991, James Meredith endorsed, and I wish I were making this up, he endorsed David Duke, the former KKK Grand Wizard, when David Duke ran for governor of Louisiana. James Meredith endorsed David Duke for governor of Louisiana. You know, in an, in an ideal world, we allow for the complexities, the multitudes inside all of us. Obviously, there are multitudes inside of James Meredith. I'm not quite sure how James Meredith goes from being a civil rights hero to endorsing David Duke for governor. Not sure how you travel that path, but I think it might involve getting shot by a sniper. I think that might have something to do with that. Anyway, the Insurrection Act, when and why it's invoked by a president can reveal the mood of our country at the time, we see that most recently it's been used to oppress people of color. Before that, it was used to protect people of color, right? First, you have George Herbert Walker Bush using the Insurrection Act to oppress people of color. And then uh, you have Lyndon Johnson and Jack Kennedy using the Insurrection Act to protect people of color. And we see that with uh, Eisenhower protecting people of color in 1957. He invoked the Insurrection Act after the governor of Arkansas deployed. By the way, these are the only times the Insurrection Act has ever been invoked. OK, Eisenhower invoked the Insurrection Act in 1957 after the governor of Arkansas deployed his state National Guard to block nine black kids from enrolling at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. OK, governor of Arkansas sends in his National Guard to block black kids from going to a white school. President Eisenhower, Republican, invokes the Insurrection Act. He federalizes those very same National Guard officers who belong to the governor of Arkansas. He says, no, nah, they're mine now. And the National Guard officers obey the president of the United States and they stand down and they let the black kids go to a white school. Interesting. Explains why racists are such strong supporters of states' rights. The federal government superseding state national guards, that doesn't sit well uh, with racists. The Insurrection Act was invoked before that in 1943 by President Franklin Roosevelt in Detroit after a riot broke out when white workers and sailors began attacking black workers and black youngsters. So, as I see it, so far, the Insurrection Act is only invoked so far uh, when black people or people of color are involved. Before that, though, uh, America was 
under the the strangling grip of Jim Crow. So uh, the Insurrection Act was invoked uh, to protect the financial well-being of the ruling elite. Uh, the next time, or the previous time, that the uh, Insurrection Act was invoked was when Hoover, Ho Herbert Hoover invoked the Insurrection Act in 32, 1932, during the bonus march, when World War I veterans camped out on the streets of Washington, D.C., demanding money that had been promised to them for their service in the war. See, now we're going back in time and we're entering a phase where the Insurrection Act is invoked not because of race, but because of economic class consciousness, economic needs, right? This is the early 20th century, the 30s. And what we're seeing is the rise of the labor movement. And like I just said, class consciousness. You have World War I veterans saying we're broke, we want our money. And before that, you see Warren Harding and Woodrow Wilson invoking the Insurrection Act to, a, a, uh, to attack striking miners using the Insurrection Act to restore order, and by restoring order means get the miners to get back, go back to work. And uh, then before that, Grover Cleveland invoked the Insurrection Act to stop a strike of railway workers. That's the Insurrection Act. And Stuart Rhodes was expecting Donald Trump to invoke, to invoke the Insurrection Act on January 6th. But there was a problem with January 6th. There were no black people storming the Capitol on January 6th. There were no union activists. It was just crazy white people. And you can't call out the National Guard on crazy white people who aren't fighting for a livable wage. The only time in American history, that you can invoke the Insurrection Act is to, uh, on white people, is if they're fighting for a livable wage. So obviously, I'm not the first one to point this out. Uh, but it's important to remember that January 6th took place immediately during or after the single biggest civil rights movement since the 1960s. Black Lives Matter, right? Black Lives Matter really came to fruition after the murder of George Floyd in Memorial Day weekend 2020. And we saw the marches throughout the year in 2020. So those marches were still going on when January 6th happened in 2021. Black Lives Matter protests in terms of numbers might have been bigger than anything we saw in the 1960s. This is why Republicans and Fox News loathe Black Lives Matter. It may have been the biggest civil rights movement since the 1960s, maybe not as successful as the civil rights movements of the 1960s. I mean, you got... I mean, go back and look at the legislation that Donald, uh, Donald Trump, Lyndon Johnson passed in the 60s. But in terms of the size, the anger, Black Lives Matter was huge. And the police were out in full force. When black people march, the police are at the ready. But in the lead up to January 6th, Right. The police were at the ready. This was Memorial Day weekend when George Floyd was killed. That was in late May of uh, 2020. January 6 was what, seven months after that. So the police were they knew they were at the ready when it came to massive protests. Black Lives Matter. Those protests were and I've. I'll keep talking about this. Whenever you saw a fire or looting, it was a police riot. Uh, but 
strangely, in the lead up to January 6th, it was strange. The FBI, the Secret Service, the Washington, D.C. police and the Capitol Police, they all knew thousands upon thousands of people were coming to Washington on January 6th. Enrique Terrio, the head of the Proud Boys, currently doing time for seditious conspiracy. He also, we know, was an FBI informant, as well as an informant, most probably uh, for the Washington, D.C. police. He told them something's brewing. Everyone knew something was brewing for January 6th. But there was little to no police presence that day. Before Donald Trump gave his big speech on the ellipse on January 6th, the Secret Service had a problem processing his supporters, allowing them in to get close to the president. The Secret Service couldn't let them uh, in because they couldn't go through the magnetometers because they all had weapons. So some of them you know, gave their weapon. The Secret Service watched these Trump supporters hand a weapon to a loved one so they could get closer to the president. And this was slowing down uh, the big rally. And Trump became furious and he asked his security detail, what the F is going on? Why can't we start? And uh, he was told, well, uh, we can't allow your supporters in close to the stage because they all have weapons. And according to January 6th testimony, when Donald Trump was told that all the people who came to see him speak had weapons, he angrily shouted, let him in. What do I care? Those weapons are not intended for me. Unquote. This was January 6th. OK, the police, the FBI and the Secret Service. They all knew thousands of heavily armed people were gathering on the ellipse to hear Trump speak. But it never occurred to anyone to alert the Capitol Police, the Washington Police, or the White House to send in reinforcements. It never occurred to anyone to challenge Donald Trump, get him on record before he spoke and say, you know, uh, there are a lot of people here with weapons. Why don't you send the National Guard in to protect the Capitol? Nobody said that to Donald Trump. Why? Because everyone was white. Everyone was white. Now, you're not allowed to teach this in Florida public schools. When Black Lives Matter protesters gathered in Washington, D.C. months earlier, in 2020, they were mowed down by police. Helicopters flew over and tear gas was deployed so Donald Trump could march through Lafayette Park to stand in front of a church and hold a Bible for a photo op. But thousands of heavily and the Black Lives Matter protesters in Lafayette Park unarmed. But thousands of heavily armed white people show up on January 6th. Law enforcement in D.C. knew for days. The Secret Service, the FBI, the Capitol Police, they knew for days that thousands of heavily armed protesters were arriving for January 6th. And yet there was no police presence. Because when white people march, we... I went over the list of when the Insurrection Act has been invoked recently. When white people march, it's never an insurrection. When white people threaten to riot or when white people do riot, it's OK. It's OK. Imagine if those January 6 protesters were black. Now, we've talked about this. I mean, this is what um, um, this is not an original thought. But imagine if those January 6 protesters were black and imagine 
if they stormed the Capitol. What do you think would have happened? Absolutely nothing. You know why? Because there's no way African-Americans would have ever behaved the way the January 6th people did because they knew exactly how it would play out. I don't mean to be indelicate, but American history dictates that if black people behaved the way the January 6ers did, it would have been a massacre, a bloodbath. History dictates that. See, we're not allowed to teach critical race down in Florida. But use your imagination, kids. What would happen if black people were marching on Washington that day? Many of you know this, but it's worth mentioning that the Black Panthers in Oakland decided to exercise their Second Amendment right to go up to the Sacramento, go up to Sacramento, California, the capital of California, while Governor Ronald Reagan was president. And they exercised their Second Amendment right to walk around the state capitol, the building and the, the visitors gallery brandishing rifles. Guess what happened? Ronald Reagan supported gun control. He saw black people with guns walking around the state capitol. Can't have that. All of a sudden, Ronald Reagan, Mr. NRA, all of a sudden as governor, he supported gun control. Trump would have been well within his rights to have invoked the emergency powers granted to him by the Insurrection Act on January 6th. Because January 6th was an insurrection. The problem is the president was leading it. That's why the president didn't invoke the Insurrection Act. He was leading an insurrection. He was hoping his supporters would spark a riot create so much chaos that he could lie the way Hitler did after the Reichstag fire. Almost identical, at least in terms of optics. Uh, he would lie and claim Antifa is responsible for the riot, that there were agent provocateurs pretending to be Trump supporters, but he would lie and say this was Antifa. Uh, and he said they 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 caused the riot and then he would have invoked the Insurrection Act and deputized perhaps his proud boys and his oath keepers. And then who knows what would have happened? I'm not sure Trump had it completely figured out. I think by January 6th, that morning, he was improvising. Uh, flying by the seat of his pants, waiting to see what would happen. Uh, he was kind of having the Proud Boys, as he said, stand back and stand by. Uh, I think the same thing was going on with the Oath Keepers. I don't think there was, I don't think this conspiracy was clearly planned out. I think he knew what his goal was chaos so he could then invoke the uh, Insurrection Act. Trump is a merchant of chaos and he depends on shocking people. And he was waiting for so much confusion on January 6th that the election couldn't be certified. That's what he was banking on. He wasn't quite sure how it was going to happen. He was hoping Mike Pence would follow his directive and not certify. And then after that, he was banking on a riot, a big enough riot uh, that would buy him enough time for Congress not to certify the election because of the riot that he could then blame on Antifa, which doesn't exist. And then the Supreme Court would intervene and uh, he would invoke his emergency powers through the Insurrection Act or 
the emergency acts of, what is it, 1976? I think he has like 250 uh, emergency powers granted to him by the Emergency Act of 1976, in addition to all the powers uh, granted to him through the Insurrection Act. He didn't have a clear plan other than mass chaos on January 6th, storm the Capitol because Mike Pence didn't obey me, and let's stop the certification of the election. Let me buy some time for me to now declare martial law. And after he declared martial law, he would uh, ask Congress to pick the next president. He would know, you know, looking like he's, you know, I'm a dem- I'm for democracy. Let Congress decide, knowing full well that if Congress decides, he has the advantage. I talked about that yesterday. According to the Electoral Count Act, if it's thrown, if the election is thrown into Congress, uh, each state gets one vote and more states and, and the vote is determined by if you know California would vote for Biden and Texas would vote for uh, Trump because you add up all the party members of your congressional delegation and whoever has the most Republicans or the most Democrats, the, if the Democrat New, New York would vote for Biden and uh, Kansas would vote for Trump. And if you look at a map of the United States, more states are red than blue. And Trump knew that. And that's what that was one of the plans, one of the options. Have Congress decide, because if Congress decides who the next president is in 2020, Trump had the advantage. And he knew that it was he was told that in the memos written by the lawyers. He was throwing it was a conspiracy. He was throwing a lot of things against the wall to see what would stick. Again, this is about chaos, uncertainty, because without chaos and uncertainty, there is no opportunity for the authoritarian white knight to rise from the ashes. That's what he was planning on becoming the authoritarian white knight. All he really wanted on January 6th, after Mike Pence refused to decertify the election, all after that, all he wanted was a riot. Uh, chaos that would create the conditions from which people would beg him to restore order. Even the Democrats would surrender all their rights just for the stability. Read the statement from Stuart Rhodes' lawyer. Stuart Rhodes, founder of the Oath Keepers, right? Uh, Yale Law School graduate, by the way. Now doing time for seditious conspiracy. Somehow, somehow he and his Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys got it in their heads that on January 6th, Donald Trump was going to use the powers granted to him by the Insurrection Act to quell an uprising. You know, he was going to call in, he would eventually call in the National Guard as well as his own private militia, like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers who were there on the ground participating in a seditious conspiracy. That's the crime they committed. That's why... They're doing 10. That's why Stuart Rhodes is doing 18 years in prison right now for seditious conspiracy. Did Sidney Powell, one of Trump's lawyers who was named as a co-conspirator in Tuesday's indictment, did she pay Stuart Rhodes' legal defenses? I'm summing up right now. That's what was reported last year. Did we ever find out? And if so, is Sidney Powell, is she the one who planted the idea in Stuart Rhodes' head that Trump was planning to invoke the Insurrection Act on January 6th? We know for a fact that one of Trump's top criminal defense attorneys helping out his associates, the the 
Oval Office associates. Stanley Woodward, right? There he is helping Walt Nota, Trump's uh, co-conspirator, indicted in the trial down in Miami for mishandling classified documents. We know lawyer Stanley Woodward is defending some of Donald Trump's closest associates, like his valet, Walt Nauta. Okay? We know that Stanley Woodward also represented Kelly Meggs, one of the founders of the Oath Keepers, who was just convicted of seditious conspiracy for January 6th. Conspiracy. Seditious conspiracy. Kelly Meggs. Attorney in that trial this year was Stanley Woodward. Does that not seem incriminating? Doesn't that seem incriminating? Am I the only one who thinks that doesn't pass the smell test? If Trump is insulated, if you're trying to insulate Donald Trump for the activities of the Oath Keepers on January 6th, If we are being led to believe, as we are by Trump apologists, that the seditious conspiracy that took place on January 6th had nothing to do with the Oval Office, then why is Trump's top defense attorney, Stanley Woodward, the one on retainer to defend Trump's closest people, why is Stanley Woodward also defending Kelly Meggs, one of the leaders of the Oath Keepers doing time right now for seditious conspiracy. Shouldn't Stanley Woodward, at the very least, declined, declined to represent an Oath Keeper just because of the way it appears? And who paid Stanley Woodward's legal fees when he was defending this Oath Keeper. Did it come out of Trump's super PAC, which spent $40 million this year on legal fees? Did any of the money that people donated to Donald Trump's super PAC, did it find its way into Stanley Baldwin's pocket for defending an Oath Keeper? Be interesting to find out. It would require a thorough examination of the legal profession. And why is Donald Trump holding fundraisers at his Bedminster, New Jersey golf course for the families of January 6th defendants? On June 23rd of this year, Donald Trump spoke at a fundraiser at his Bedminster golf course Louis Gohmert, Congressman Louis Gohmert, arranged this. Former Congressman Louis Gohmert arranged a fundraiser at Donald Trump's Bedminster Golf Course, June 23rd of this year, for the families of all those January Sixers who are in prison or in jail awaiting trial. You have all these January 6th defendants doing time right now, some of them for seditious conspiracy. Who's paying their legal fees? Looks like Trump. Seditious conspiracy means there was a conspiracy. Who's paying everyone's legal fees and what silence does that purchase? Legal fees Millions of dollars sometimes to keep you out of prison. Seditious conspiracy means there was a conspiracy. This isn't paranoia. It's a fact. You have January Sixers doing time for seditious conspiracy. How big was the January 6th conspiracy? Trump's indictment... On Tuesday, named six of Trump's co-conspirators. This was a conspiracy of lawyers. This was a conspiracy 
of lawyers. Five of the six co-conspirators are lawyers. Maybe all six are lawyers. Stuart Rhodes, the founder of the Oath Keepers, doing time for seditious conspiracy, is a Yale Law School graduate. Okay, Stuart Rhodes, Yale Law School. From the top of the food chain on January 6, you had two lawyers, John Eastman and Rudy Giuliani. There they are, both of them speaking on the ellipse. Warming up the crowd for Trump on January 6th, John Eastman and Rudy Giuliani are pretty much named in the indictment as Trump's co-conspirators, and they spoke to the crowd on January 6th. They spoke to that heavily armed crowd. These two lawyers spoke, spoke to a heavily armed crowd on January 6th. Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman had just lost 61 cases challenging the election results. And Rudy Giuliani stood before that heavily armed crowd as Trump's attorney and shouted, quote, let's have trial by combat. Because he was out of options. He had lost 61 cases challenging the election results. They were out of options when Trump spoke, when Rudy Giuliani spoke, when John Eastman spoke on the ellipse on January 6th. They had run out of all options. They lost 61 cases trying to prove election fraud. And Mike Pence said he was going to certify the election for Joe Biden They were out of options. The only option left was for Rudy Giuliani to stand before a heavily armed crowd on January 6th and shout, let's have trial by combat. And his associate, John Eastman, lawyer, was was standing right next to him. That's the top of the food chain on January 6, right before the riot. And at the bottom of the food chain on January 6 was Yale Law School graduate Stuart Rhodes, fully armed with a hotel room overflowing with weapons, communicating with his other oath keepers on the ground as they stormed the Capitol. The entire food chain of January 6, lawyers, right? You got John Eastman and Rudy Giuliani warming up the crowd on January 6, telling the armed insurrectionists it's trial by combat because we're out of options. He didn't say we're out of options, but they were the only thing they had left By the time Donald Trump was about to speak, the only thing they had left was violence. That's all they had left. And Rudy Giuliani said it's time for trial by combat. And at the bottom of the food chain, Yale Law School graduate Stuart Rhodes giving out the orders. And you got Stuart Rhodes got Stuart Rhodes doing time right now for seditious conspiracy. Five, possibly six of Donald Trump's co-conspirators in Tuesday's indictments are lawyers. January 6th couldn't have happened without lawyers. Now, why is that? Because in America, lawyers are convinced that they are above the law. Lawyers are convinced that the law doesn't apply to them. And this is why we are becoming an ever increasingly lawless society. I keep asking, what does it take to get Rudy Giuliani disbarred? Lawyers never get disbarred. Rudy Giuliani still has his law license. It's been suspended in D.C., 
but he still had and, and New York, but it has he hasn't been disbarred. What does it take? I'm pretty certain that all five of the co-conspirators who are l- lawyers mentioned in the indictment, I'm pretty sure they haven't been disbarred yet. John Eastman is going through a disbarment hearing in California right now. What does it take to disbar a lawyer? Uh, Why don't we disbar lawyers? Because lawyers are policing other lawyers. And that's why so many lawyers believe they are above the law. Now, I'm going to end with uh, correcting a misnomer. Shakespeare did have a character who said, kill all the lawyers. And it's been taken out of context. Shakespeare in Henry VI was actually defending lawyers in that speech when the character says, kill all the lawyers. The line is the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. It is among Shakespeare's most famous lines, and it's always taken out of context. It's said by Dick the Butcher in Henry VI. Uh, Context. Who's saying it? Dick the Butcher is a henchman. He's evil. He's a brute. So when Dick the Butcher shouts, first, let's kill all the lawyers, Shakespeare is defending lawyers. He's saying lawyers are what stands between us and the mob. Lawyers were not defending us on January 6th. They weren't standing between us and the mob. They were inciting the mob. So forget Shakespeare. Forget killing all the lawyers. That's not what Shakespeare meant. I say lock them all up. Start disbarring all the lawyers and start locking them up. Lawyers are all scumbags. They're bullies who are trained to think they're smarter than you and me. Now, I know there are probably some lawyers who don't like my painting with such a large brush when I call all lawyers scumbags. Well, prove me wrong. Are you Jack Smith? Are you Bill Kunstler? Prove to me you're not a scumbag. Otherwise, I blame most of the problems, the lawlessness in America, on the legal profession. And I say this because I know I'm not going to get any angry letters from lawyers because they can't bill me for them. Why would they write me an angry letter if they can't also include a bill for the letter? Yeah, lock up all the lawyers and let them out of prison on a case by case basis. Prove to me you're not a scumbag. 99% of lawyers in America are scumbags. How do I know that? Because we're a lawless society. Prove to me, if you're a lawyer, that you're not a scumbag. There are a handful of good lawyers in America. The rest are scumbags. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak.